Hinton, beginning from Moscow Institute of Physics and the Technology. He will talk about the alternative or nanophotonic um, names, biosensor R chip. Please start. Thank you very much for introduction. Uh, probably I'm not a perfect speaker for this session because I'm, I'm not going to talk about applications instead of this. Uh, I will introduce uh, a concept of uh, integrated all nanophotonics mechanical biosensor which uh, is uh, fabricated on a silicon chip that can be integrated in any device like your smartphone but again it's a concept and uh, so we just started the work on it, and I think it can go into production in like five or ten years. Uh, but the idea of this sense is very interesting because it is able to detect single molecules and consequently can measure a very small concentration of molecules in the environment, which is the ultimate goal for biosensing. This is the outline of my talk. I start with a background of the concept, but I do it in a very unusual way because uh, I will talk about my, our personal background, how we conceived the concept, not the uh, field of uh, mechanical biosensors, uh, because we started uh, from the data processing device, and after that I moved to mechanical mass sensors. And finally, the main part of the talk about all nanophotonic biosensor, its operation in vacuum atmosphere, and here I report about the sensitivity of the device and summarize giving some conclusions. Well, the background of the concept. We are guys who work in uh, the field of uh, nanoscale data processing and data transmission devices, and we started with the concept of electro-optic modulator, but using some mechanics, and we tried to design a device which converts electrical signal voltage into optical signal. So in case of uh, amplitude modulation, the, the idea of this device is, is very simple. It's like the door which is open. When you apply a voltage to the modulator and the door is closed, then you don't apply a voltage. And in this case, uh, the light can pass through the device. And in, when you don't apply voltage, the light is absorbed or reflected or so on. And uh, the main idea of the concept was to use some nanowires to do this and uh, the idea is uh, straightforward but at the same time very elegant if we consider a nanowire array which consists of four or six uh, nanowires placed above on a nanophotonic or plasmonic waveguide there is just nothing then the separation distance between the nanowire array and the waveguide is uh, large enough but as the distance between uh, the waveguide and the nanowire decreases the propagating guided uh, photonic or plasmonic mode starts to interact with the nanowires and the nanowires scatter the radiation and the transmitted power is lower than the incident power so it's uh, the concept of them modulate and we control the intensity of the transmitted uh, light power. Why nanowires? It's because of uh, their small size combined with unique electrical and mechanical properties the oscillation frequency of the nanowires can be in the kilohertz or even the gigahertz range and at the same time the amplitude of oscillations can exceed several tens of micrometers which give you almost unlimited possibilities in new concepts in mechanics and finally nanowires are very sensitive so even a very tiny force can drive the nanowire uh, mechanical system we also try to expand the concept to Nanotubes, uh, however, in optics, uh, nanotubes are too small and uh, don't uh, reflect and uh, absorb light almost if you consider 4 or 10 nanotubes. That's why we focus on the nanowires and uh, conceived a concept of this electro optic modulator if you apply a bias voltage between a waveguide and a nanowire array or between a nanowire array and additional electrode you can control the position of this nanowires above the nanophotonic waveguide and consequently you can modulate the intensity of the transmitted wave however in our case the modulation depth was not so high and instead of obtaining such a nice picture as I uh, discussed previously, which is like a door which can be open or closed. We have uh, such a picture when the door is always open and we can only slightly 
control its position. That's why this scheme is not suitable for some digital modulation, digital application. And since we are working in the field of uh, data transmission and data processing devices, this concept does not simply work. And it can be used only for analog modulation, which, I mean, is, is not very popular today and is not very common. However, we found that these nanowires are very sensitive, sensitive to the shape of nanowires, to their weight, to the uh, force which is acting <coughs> on the nanowires. And we decided to consider this system as the mechanical sensor and found that this concept is already developed and this uh, mechanical um, nanomechanical or micro-mechanical system have already been used as mass sensors. Typically, nano-electromechanical or micro-electromechanical system is very complicated in shape and it's very difficult to describe it because, again, because of this complicated shape, but we can reduce this system to a very simple system, introducing some effective parameters and consider it like a simplified mechanical system, which is a weight attached to a linear spring. And the eigenfrequency of this mechanical system is given by this very simple and nice equation, where k is the spring constant and m is the mass of the weight. For the equivalent simplified circuit, we can introduce the effective parameters and also represent the frequency of mechanical oscillations in this way. And in order to use this system as a mass sensor, we can simply consider the increase of the mass of the weight. It means that, for example, a biomolecule such as a protein or DNA is attached to this mass sensor. The mass of, of the mechanical system increases and consequently we can observe decrease in the eigenfrequency uh, of, of this mechanical system which can be clearly seen in the dependence of uh, the amplitude of mechanical oscillations on the frequency of, of the exciting force or if we operate at a fixed frequency we can observe decrease or increase in the amplitude of mechanical oscillations. So we tried to move on the concept and consider a nanowire or a nanobeam cantilever. The end of this cantilever is covered by the uh, biological binding layer in order to efficiently absorb molecules from the environment and uh, as the molecule is uh, attached, is absorbed uh, on the surface of the cantilever, we have uh, this frequency displacement and since for nanowires the eigenfrequency is high and uh, the mass of the nanowire is low, we obtain a very high responsivity. So we can detect molecules with a very small mass and I'll show you later that the sensitivity of such a device is really high. However, in order to implement this concept, we need to efficiently excite mechanical oscillations and read out these oscillations and typically people in the field of non-electromechanical and micro-electromechanical systems uh, use different techniques such as electrostatic, magnetomotive, thermal, piezo-resistive, piezoelectric and some others but these techniques have several disadvantages. For example, if we consider a magnetomotive technique you need a high magnetic field and consequently you need a big magnet that's why your system is not compact at all and you can use such kind of a device which is nanoscale only in the lab but Ideally, of course, we want such devices to be integrated in, in some uh, small uh, packages and even implementing something like smartphones. For electrostatic technique, uh, we need a nanoscale circuit on the surface of the nanobeam cantilever, which makes the fabrication process very complicated and uh, consequently the reproducibility of the fabrication process is expected to be low. That's why it's, it's not really... Uh, a good approach for practical application. Also, other techniques has, have their own drawbacks. For example, for piezoelectric and piezo-resistive techniques, you need some piezoelectric uh, fabricated here, which makes the system very expensive. And uh, also, this technique introduces additional damping, which reduces the quality factor of this mechanical resonator and consequently reduces the sensitivity. Finally, if we deal with some currents in, in such a device, if, and if we put this device into gas or liquid environment, we have some leakage currents and uh, it's also not convenient because you need to adjust the device uh, for every environment. Optical technique is an approach which is going to solve this problem and probably it's a surprise, but 
people have already used this uh, optical technique in many practical devices, such as the atomic force microscope, maybe I think you are familiar with this device. And uh, in this device, the cantilever plays a role of a mirror and uh, uh, reflects uh, the incident laser beam into different directions, directions according to the position of the cantilever. And when the cantilever oscillates, we can measure this using this sensor. Uh, also, you can do some interferometric techniques in order to increase the sensitivity of the device and measure very small displacements, which can be as small as few nanometers, which uh, is, is, is very um, uh, useful when we, you deal with very high frequencies. However, when you want to design a very small device, really a nanoscale device, and integrate on a chip, these approaches are too bulky because they deal with uh, some external equipment. And uh, that's why we need to move something else. And a big step forward was uh, done in uh, 2010 and 2012, but these papers were published after we introduced the concept of uh, <coughs> our uh, electro-optic mechanical modulator. Guys who published uh, these uh, papers uh, proposed to use an optical fiber to excite a cantilever. The optical mode propagating along the optical fiber can uh, uh, actuate the cantilever and at the same time uh, another optical wave propagation on this optical fiber can measure its oscillations. And actually they fabricated uh, such, such a mechanical system and positioned the fiber near this mechanical system and obtained quite good characteristics but again the optical fiber is not integratable so you need to position the optical fiber anytime you want to do some uh, measurements and uh, it's not suitable for mass production, that's why our concept of uh, integrated uh, electro-optic modulator is, is very interesting for the purpose of uh, such uh, bio uh, sensors because it consists of only two parts, the nanophotonic waveguide or plasmonic waveguide, it depends on the characteristics you want to obtain and a silicon nitride cantilever which is suspended above the, this photonic or plasmonic waveguide. Uh, it is fabricated in a CMOS process and you can fabricate at the same cheap uh, thousands of such devices and you can have only one optical input and one optical output and measure a lot of things at the same small chip. Uh, to excite the oscillations of uh, this cantilever, we should use a pump signal which should be sinusoidally modulated at the, at the frequency which is very close to the eigenfrequency of this silicon nitride cantilever. And to measure these oscillations, to measure the amplitude and the fuzz of oscillations, we should use another uh, optical signal propagating uh, along the photonic waveguide which is excited at a different light wavelength and the oscillation cantilever just modulates the probe signal and the power of the probe signal as the output of the waveguide depends on the position of the cantilever that's why we can measure the phase and the amplitude of the cantilever oscillations. The nano beam cantilever is very small which ensures its very high sensitivity. In our case the length is only 5 micrometers which <coughs> is 1 micrometer and uh, the, the height is uh, 90 nanometers. The quality factor for such a device in vacuum is, is, is quite high. It is uh, equal to 3,500, and it's the experimental value, not theoretical. The um, eigenfrequency is in the megahertz range, and the responsivity is uh, very high, which guarantees you to measure very, very low masses. This picture shows um, the uh, simulations of the transmission of the optical signal uh, through the section with the cantilever. It's, it's not, so it's difficult to see here, but uh, here is the cantilever which is very close to the surface of the silicon photonic waveguide. Since the cantilever is very close to the waveguide surface, so this is the waveguide surface, we can see very strong scattering. And when the cantilever is far from the waveguide surface, we don't have interaction of the guided mode with the cantilever and uh, the signal just passes through this section without any scattering and it's uh, the basis of the transduction, transduction scheme. 
Uh, for the plasmonic waveguide, we obtain much, much better pictures because you know that surface plasma polaritons are very sensitive to everything that, that happens near the metal surface. That's why SPR biosensors are so popular and they're so sensitive. So you see very strong scattering and the uh, cantilever is very close to the metal surface and you simply don't absorb any, any significant scattering that the cantilever is far, far from the metal surface. Uh, I'll skip this figure, just some uh, quantitative numbers uh, related to the previous pictures. The actuation scheme uh, is based on the same nanophotonic waveguide, which simplifies the fabrication process, and this figure shows schematically the mm, distribution of the transverse electric field of the propagating <laughs> photonic mode. And this is the cantilever, and since we have some electric field, uh, this uh, propagating plasmo of plasmonic or photonic mode, it depends on the case in, in the figure uh, the photonic mode is shown, organizes <coughs> the nanobeam cantilever, so you see some dipoles, and at the same time this field of uh, the propagating photonic mode acts on the cantilever and excites the oscillations, if of course the uh, pump signal is uh, modulated. Also, you have uh, some forces due to light scattering, so-called light pressure forces. And uh, finally, they give uh, you the total force, and uh, we found that the amplitude of the oscillations, in the case of the burst, but the most simple in fabrication process, silicon photonic waveguide, you probably know there is a branch of photonics, silicon photonics, uh, which deals with silicon photonic waveguides, and you can fabricate them in a large number on a chip, and the fabrication process is, is very cheap. In this case, the oscillation uh, amplitude is uh, equal to about uh, 8 nanometers, so slightly lower, and in case of plasmonic waveguide, which is very sensitive, as I uh, mentioned previously, the oscillation amplitude is as high as 50 nanometers than the separation distance between the mm, photonic waveguide and uh, mm, oh, sorry, plasmonic waveguide and the cantilever is from 50 to 100 nanometers. So when you have such a nice picture, then the oscillation amplitude is almost equal to the distance, separation distance between the cantilever and uh, the metal surface. But the characteristic we are interested in is the sensitivity. Uh, in case the operation in vacuum, because these uh, mechanical uh, devices typically operate in vacuum because of uh, the relatively low quality factor of such systems, mm, the main source of noise is the fair me mechanical noise acting on the mm, cantilever, and uh, they found that at the photo detector the relative intensity noise is about minus 150 dB, at the same time the laser noise for telecommunication lasers which are used in this uh, work, less than this number, they are typically minus 160 or minus 165, that's why we have a very important result that the sensitivity of the system is determined by the inherent properties of the mechanical system rather than the properties of the laser source. That's why the actuation transaction scheme doesn't actually limit the performance of the device. And we uh, followed this paper to calculate the sensitivity, and in case of the burst waveguide, the resolution is about 4 kilodalton at a measurement bandwidth of 100 hertz. Uh, you can also improve your resolution, uh, decreasing the measurement bandwidth, but it's very difficult to do because of some electronic limitations. And so also, you don't, of course, want the high price, the high price of, of the device. Now I move to the operation in atmosphere, and here we have some problems, uh, and they are from the damping. Because besides the inherent damping of the cantilever, which is due to some defects in the cantilever, we have also damping due to uh, collisions of uh, gas molecules with uh, the cantilever surface. And also you know that uh, as uh, the pressure of the gas increases, you also have some uh, viscous friction, and you have an additional contribution, and finally a very interesting effect, then the cantilever is placed near the metal surface, you have an additional so-called squeeze film damping, then um, the cantilever moves in the vertical direction, uh, the air in the gap between the cantilever and the gate surface or the substrate moves in the horizontal direction, and due to viscosity you have uh, friction with uh, the surface of the cantilever and the surface of the gate or the substrate, and it reduces a huge damping, 
and we calculated the quality <coughs> factor, and the quality factor is almost equal to zero than the separation distance between the backgate and the cantilever is as small as 100 nanometers. Uh, I don't have uh, too much time to go into details, but the main, this is the main plot. Uh, we calculated the sensitivity, and we found that for the plasmonic wavegas, the sensitivity is about 100 kilodalton in atmosphere at room temperature, which is a very, very good number because it gives a possibility to detect single molecules such as proteins and DNA molecules in atmosphere. And since the advantages of this device, you can integrate it into a very, very uh, small package and use them, for example, in future in smartphones and so on. Uh, it's the summer, I skip this, and these are the figures of the fabricated structures. The fabrication process is not difficult, but it took us quite a while to adjust the setup. And so in reality, the, uh, the structure looks uh, like, like this. Now we conduct the experimental measurements, and the previous were the theoretical results, which I think we confirm in the next several months. Thank you very much for your attention. One slide after operation in air should come the slide operation in water because I don't know many people looking for DNA in air. And in water, not only your damping will be bigger, but you hydrodynamic forces just from the flow because you need to get your molecules there are probably going to break it. And also temperature sensitivity is a problem. If 0.01 degrees difference in temperature yes. is going to be yeah, 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 you're than one right. molecule, then you're never going to see one molecule. How are you going to solve it? Yeah, you're absolutely right because we, we have uh, some additional noise and we took uh, the noise due to the gas into account. But yeah, and, and so, and also a lot of work to do. And so right now I, I can say that only we are on the way because it's not our only topic. And we are on the way how to, to move the heat to, to practical measurements. But yes, we have the same problems with temperature fluctuation and especially when we have a lot of molecules at high temperature. So the situation is, is of course much worse. But so also people in the past have some problems with the, so some other problems. With, eliminated some of them, but with still some fundamental limitations, and yes, we, we are trying to overcome them, but it's a long way, and yeah, you're absolutely right, but I think that we probably can do some something which can be very close to practical. In, of course, not right now, but in, 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 in a while. And there's one more issue. In one of the pictures, you saw that the sensitive area will be at the end of the cantilever, so you need your molecules to be far away from where it's holding and, and not anywhere along it because then the effect of each molecule will be different. But once your structure is so small, to modify only the end of it with any capture layer is going to be complicated. Right? We can print 10 micron drops, maybe 2 micron drops, but then it's going to cover everything. It's, it's a very good question. Uh, right now, so we, we are not uh, working with chemistry, but I know the papers where people fabricated very similar structures. They used nanobeam cantilever and fabricated the binding layer only at the very end of the cantilever, and the size of their cantilevers is nearly the same. In our calculations, they took the quality factor of the cantilever from their work, and in, in their paper, they fabricated the binding layer at the very end of the cantilever, and so right now, so we can discuss this later, later but uh, I, can, I should look into the paper, but it, it's not, I mean, of course it's a complicated process, but now somebody have already solved this, of course, not for every molecule, because it depends on the type of the binding layer, but it's, it's more a technological problem, and the problem, the issue with the temperature and fluctuation is much more critical in our case rather than just fabrication difficulty.